Hi, this is Dr. Michael Latola, and I'd like to welcome you to this clinical presentation from Glidewell Laboratories. Today we're going to take another look at a unique use of no-prep veneers. The more no-prep veneers I do, the more unique uses I seem to find when I need a conservative situation and I don't necessarily want to prepare any teeth, but I have a problem that I'd like to solve. And in this case, you're going to see we have an interesting situation, some huge open gingival embrasures that you see here. These are post-periodontal surgery, and I'm happy to report that the patient's tissue is now very healthy, as well as the pocket depths for the time being. But we have these huge open gingival embrasures uh, between teeth, 8, 9, and 10 specifically. As we zoom in, you can see just how large these embrasures are. The patient reports getting food caught in here when she eats. She doesn't like to smile anymore. When her teeth are together and she smiles, you can see her tongue uh, through it as well, and that's an issue. So, And you can see with the black background, as you take a peek through here, that it's really apparent the shadow that that would uh, cast. And uh, typically, if you just see pink and white, you won't notice anything, uh, any kind of problem like that aesthetically. But when you put that black background in back of it or have the shadow of the patient's mouth, it's going to show a lot. So here goes the first one into place. It's an interproximal veneer on the mesial of tooth number 10. Again, these have been made with no preparation whatsoever, and they're just being placed with try and cement at this point. You can see I have a class 5 instrument that I'm using to help position uh, the veneer. Now we come in with the second veneer on a Viva stick, and it starts to pull the first one off as I touch it there. But I use an instrument to hold it in place, and those are the first two interproximal veneers. Unlike a traditional veneer, which has a nice stop against the incisal edge, these kind of float a little bit. So you'll see me push them down and then try to slide them to the lingual slide them back towards the facial. You really want to play with these a little bit in this try and cement stage and get a feel for where these were on the model when the technician waxed them up and then they were pressed in porcelain. So there, you need to make sure that you get an idea of where it's going to go because when you try this in with the real cement, you're going to need to have this idea of where to place it as well. So now we're placing this one on the mesial of tooth number eight. Again, using the Viva stick to position it with the try and cement in place and then pushing it into place. These look like little shark teeth almost. They're white at the gingival base and then they come to a point interproximally towards the incisal area of the gingival embrasure. And again, taking an instrument and pushing these around a little bit, just trying to see where these fit the contour of the teeth the best. And that's what you're looking for. And you want to get an idea and kind of memorize it in your head so that when you place these porcelain veneers on with the real cement on the inside, you're able to do the same little bit of maneuvering and end up with these pieces in the same place. After we cure these, we're going to finish the margins down. And um, so even if they are off just a little bit and we have a little bit of a ledge, we're going to be able to finish that down with the Ceraglaze porcelain finishing kit. Give the patient a mirror. patient approves of how these look. So we're going to pumice the teeth at this point. We want to make sure the teeth are really clean. We always do, but we know we're probably not bonding onto a lot of enamel here where we've had the recession as a result of the gingival surgery. We know that we've got a lot of exposed cementum. So we're going to be bonding to cementum and enamel here. So we use the preppies from Wick Mix to pumice the teeth and get the salivary pellicle and everything off the surface of the tooth. Now we're using the Ultra Etch from Ultradent. Uh, our standard 37% phosphoric acid etch, and etching the interproximal areas of the teeth. We're not too concerned about getting the uh, acid etch in contact with the gingival tissue because the gingival tissue is so healthy. If this were a case where we were looting veneers that had been prepped and that had temporaries on them, we'd be very careful not to get the etch on the gingiva because it could cause bleeding. So here, we just kind of liberally apply it interproximally to these two teeth, and we apply it just beyond where we expect uh, the edge of the veneer to be because, again, we're going to be playing with these veneers, moving them back and forth, and want to give ourselves just a little bit extra uh, margin of error here by placing the uh, acid edge just a little bit outside of where we expect the edge of the porcelain veneer to be just in case the position is slightly different. Once we've had a chance to do that, we're going to dry off after we rinse all the etch off of there, place our first layer of bonding agent, and uh, again, because we don't have any dentin involved, we're going to use just a regular uh, dentin bonding agent, the dark green from the Scotch bond. And you can see here I'm blowing on my watch, 
and you can see this is out of my assistance three-way syringe you can see the water bursts that are coming out of here and this is something that I do with my loops on I look and watch the face of my watch as I blow it on now I can see its air uh, as I push it towards the end so that happens more on her syringe than mine I'm using mine here so I don't have to worry about that but I just wanted to illustrate that anytime you go to an etched tooth um, before or after adhesive or whether or not you're going to uh, evaporate some primer it's really helpful just to put a little blast of air down on the face of your watch if you're wearing one and see whether or not you have any moisture there because that can be uh, an issue as you go in there and try to dry that off and you can sometimes see the moisture appear even on the tooth with the loops on now that we've cured the bonding agent the scotch bond uh, dark green bottle into place we are now placing the veneer pieces with vario link veneer so this is the very only veneer shade zero the medium value or the translucent shade of this veneer cement and we're putting into place and again I'm just moving this interproximal veneer just slightly with this class 5 or this cord packing instrument to make sure it's in the position that I want and then I'm using the instrument to remove just a little bit of the excess the cement that is extending beyond the margin of this interproximal veneer. Once I've had the opportunity to clean up the majority of the excess cement, my assistant will come in and just tack it into place. I don't, again, want to have the both of these veneer pieces moving like they were during the try-in when I accidentally touched the Viva stick to the first veneer. So we tack that first veneer into place, and now we place the second one in. Again, this is with live cement at this point, and then I'm using the class 5 or the cord packing instrument to maneuver it into place to try to push it to the lingual and see how that facial margin fits. See if it looks like the diastema is as closed as it was during the try-in. And then I can push this down and make sure that I've got nice adaptation between this veneer and between the tooth itself. Again, there is a right position where this veneer belongs and it's in the same place where the laboratory technician waxed it. And so that's what I'm searching for. As I hold it in place with my instrument where I feel is the correct position, my assistant comes in again and tacks it into place and then I'll begin to use this instrument to remove any excess cement from around the margins of this veneer and from the interproximal area we want to make sure we don't uh, leave any cured cement on top of the papilla. We're now placing the mesial proximal veneer on the mesial of tooth number nine. Again this one seems to have gone relatively easy into place in about the right position where it needs to be. Sometimes just looking around the gingival contour can help make up your mind. If you feel like you do have an open margin because you've slid it to, you know, towards the lingual and you don't have any, you can see I'm placing a little extra varial link veneer here just to make sure that we do have some at that margin. You want to be careful while cleaning it to make sure you don't pull cement out from underneath that margin. So sometimes we'll actually leave some excess material at the margin of the veneer and then we can actually uh, polish that away a little bit later. But we'd rather have excess cement that we have to polish off rather than having not enough cement and having a gap between the ceramic material and the tooth because we know that'll pick up stains and the patient will come back later and not be very happy about that stain that's showing up at the junction of the veneer and the uh, tooth. Okay, so now we're placing the interproximal veneer on the mesial of tooth number eight. Again, using our class five instrument to kind of manipulate it into place. We started off with a pretty huge gap between those two teeth and so, you know, any reduction in the size of that open gingival embrasure is a step in the right direction. Even if you're not able to close that gingival embrasure completely, um, the more you can close it, the less of an embarrassment it will be for the patient, the less food that will get caught in there, and it's, you know, you may have to, uh, if you close it, square everything off so much that it's not a healthy situation for the gingiva. And on somebody who's already had periodontal surgery, you want to be careful not to do too much of that. So my assistant has come in now and done the final cure. I've got a gold knife here that I'm using right around the gingiva. Some uh, clinicians like to use a curved scalpel for this, and that's fine. Uh, but I like to use something that's got a metal handle and a little thicker blade here like the gold knife. I can use the tip in several directions with a pulling action, using to kind of chip away at excess cement that's in the gingival embrasure. So I like how the gold knife works. This is a safe-sided strip, serrated strip from Axis Dental. And so it's smooth on both sides, but it's got a little hacksaw edge to it. And I have found that this will cut through any contact that I have inadvertently uh, bonded closed, whether it was bonded closed with bonding agent or in this case, variolink link veneer. I always find that I'm able to go in there and break it with those serrated strips. 
Next, we're going to use the Sarah Glaze Ultimate Polishing Kit. You'll notice the three grits that we have there. The first one's the green. This removes the most amount of porcelain. And I use a cup for the big surface area uh, to blend the edge, the thin edge of the veneer with the two structure itself. And so we will use this uh, cup because it provides more surface area in contact with the tooth. It also comes in the shape of uh, a disc and a point, as you'll see in a minute. And those shapes are good, too, for some other particular areas. But whenever I have access, I use this cup shape because I like having uh, all that surface area in contact with the tooth. When it comes to an interproximal area like this, I am using the point here to dive a little more into that gingival embrasure. And again, this uh, green contouring set uh, of discs and cups and wheels will remove uh, ceramic material. So you want to use this uh, judiciously and you want to make sure you don't remove uh, too much material here. But if you're blending margins like we are here, it's a good thing and you want to be able to remove some ceramic material. Uh, these wheels and cups can also be used on porcelain after occlusal adjustments have been made or anytime you have a rough area that you need to smooth off, whether it's a porcelain fracture or something like that. And then once you've done that and done the recontouring uh, of the porcelain material, we're going to go to the beginning of the polish, which is done in this case with a blue cup. And this will get it pretty darn smooth uh, for as much roughness as that first uh, green set of polishers creates. The blue ones, such as the blue cup shown here, which also comes in a disc and also comes in a point as well. This will really smooth it off. And then when we get down to the point of wanting to see the wet high shine back on our ceramic material, we'll switch to the yellow. Again, anywhere I can use the cup, I do use the cup because of the fact that I like the increased surface area in contact with the tooth. And as our polishing materials become uh, more fine, we turn the water on because of the increased heat generation. There we are using a finishing strip from 3M SP to go in and make sure that we've smoothed off all the interproximal areas where we may have some cement left. And you can see we've closed up just about everything between tooth 9 and 10. We have a little space between teeth number 8 and 9, and we had told the patient that one was going to be pretty impossible to close all the way. And when you look at the top at the before and you look at the after, you can see exactly how much was done and again for no prep veneers where we didn't have to drill didn't have to temporize or do anything like that this is a huge improvement for the patient and the patient was just ecstatic when we were done and happily paid and we charged the same thing as we did for regular veneers here they were smaller pieces of porcelain i understand that but the technique of placing them was much more difficult there was no positive stop to know when they were in place and it definitely took more finesse and uh, definitely took more work to get them in the right position. You can see how nice she looks uh, in her portrait picture at the right when she smiles now. All those spaces are gone. And when she smiles, all you see is a little bit of pink from the gingiva and the white from her teeth and the porcelain material. And that's what she wanted. She just didn't like those big black triangles and how those shadows appeared in person or when she was smiling for a picture. So... Again, my compliments to our technicians uh, for a great use, a great innovative use of our no-prep veneers.